I mean, we can we can't hear you. Okay. Okay, give me one second. I have to send the link to uh, Councilman Jones. see where's the invite list <laughs> q and a oh, one second He just sent me a text that he needs the, the uh, invite um, and is no longer posted on this site because it started. Oh, let's see. Does anybody have the link in their email? Kitty does. I have it. Kitty does. Okay, can you post that in the chat so I can copy it and send it to uh, Councilman Jones? Yeah, give me two seconds. I'm going to my email. So in the meantime, um, I'm gonna introduce everybody here. Let's see, we have uh, Ms. Honecker from Grace, uh, excuse me, um, Kingsville Manor. Mr. Eugene Clark from Senator Stidnor's office. We have Delegate Sheila Ruth, First District um, House of Delegates. We have Ms. Carrie Lassner from Grayson. We have Officer Elizabeth Clark from Reach. And we have. Okay, Brian, it's there. Officer for. Um, what school are What school do you have right now? Okay. Sorry, you keep fading in and out. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I keep jumping to my keep jumping to my car. I turn my car off. All right, is that better? Yes. Okay. All right. So the the format will be we'll give the uh, our guests five minutes or so to talk about whatever they want, um, legislative updates, um, and then we'll go into our 10 questions. Um, just let you know, I know uh, Delegate Ruth has to uh, jump off shortly and so does Councilman Jones. So we'll go with um, Delegate Sheila Ruth, if you wanna introduce yourself and you have your five minutes to say whatever you wanna say. Thank you so much. You can hear me. Yes, ma'am. Great, great. Thank you. So, um, um, Delegate Sheila Ruth, um, this was my first full session uh, because last session I was appointed late in the session and then we adjourned early. So, um, this was my first full session and and what a session it was um, with, you know, the COVID restrictions. It was definitely unusual. We did a lot of our work virtually. Um, the floor sessions we we were in person for for full house floor sessions but um you know we had 
in the house, we had two separate chambers. I was in what was called the annex, which was the, the, the secondary chamber, but we were connected by audio and video. Um, so it, it was definitely unusual. Um, it was, uh, I think we really lost something by not having the public there interacting. Um, on the plus side, there was more availability of live streams, even voting sessions were live streamed, which have never been done before. Um, people could participate from home, um, upload testimony from home and, you know, testify in hearings. So there was good things and bad things about it. Um, but I, I really look forward to next session when hopefully the public can come back again and, um, you know, really engage in advocacy, because I think that's an important part of the process. Um, uh, you know, we, um, we started out not knowing if we were even going to be able to finish the session, if there was a surge in COVID, if there was an outbreak or how much we would get done. Um, and we ended the session. I think we accomplished a huge, huge amount. It was a, it was a very successful session, um, starting with, you know, uh, the overrides. We overrode the veto on the, the blueprint. Um, we we passed finally the, the funding for the HBCUs. Um, that's been, you know, a, a decade, I guess, in the making. Um, we overrode a number of other bills. We enacted police reform, which was, you know, huge and I think is going to be transformative. We we passed a budget, which was much more positive than we expected the budget to be um, between recovery, economic recovery and federal funds coming in. Um, we were able to close the, the structural deficit for two years build up the rainy day fund and and still you know have have money to help people and help with various programs um, i'm on the environment and transportation committee so uh, i'm going to talk about a couple things that that came through my committee the big question was the climate solutions now bill that was our big um, climate bill unfortunately the climate solutions bill did not pass what happened was um, the house had one version the Senate had another version, and we weren't able to come to agreement before we ran out of time. However, the good news is some of the provisions of the Climate Solutions Now bill did pass um, as, as separate bills. One of those was the Tree Solutions Now Act. And what, what the Tree Solutions Now Act does is it sets a state goal of planting 5 million trees in the state over the next decade. Trees, of course, are, are hugely important. They store carbon, which will really help with, you know, reducing the, the impact of climate change. They help um, reduce runoff of nutrients to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and, you know, they, they uh, improve the quality of air. So, so they're really important. And one part of this bill, which I think is particularly important, is the urban tree program. So of those 5 million trees, um, the, the goal is that 500,000 of those will be planted in urban areas um, per, where they can really make a difference in the quality of life and the air quality and reducing the heat islands where, um, you know, certain areas, urban areas get extra, extra hot and having trees there will um, reduce that. So, so I think that's going to be a hugely consequential and important bill. Um, the other thing that was from the Climate Solutions Now that passed as a separate bill is the Zero Emissions Bus Transition Act, which requires that starting in fiscal year 23, um, the Maryland Transit Administration, as they purchase buses to replace the fleet, they have to purchase zero emissions buses. So there again, that's gonna make a big difference in, in reducing our um, you know, climate impact um, and, and to bring us down to that net zero that we really need to get to in order to prevent the worst impacts of, of the, the climate crisis. Um, another bill that, that I want to mention that passed that I think is really important is the Transit Safety and Investment Act. Um, this was a bill sponsored by Delegate Brooke Learman. So we, we have a huge maintenance backlog on our transit, um, which is both a safety and a reliability issue. When buses and metro break down, um, it, it causes people to be late um, it, there's not enough buses running. Um, it's also a disability issue because I've heard like um, that wheelchair lifts sometimes break down on the buses, but it's also a safety issue. And um, I don't, you probably remember in 2018, 
the the subway was shut down suddenly for a month um, because of uh, you know safety inspection revealed a, a track issue which was dangerous. So they had to shut it down suddenly for a month. So what the Transit Safety and Investment Act does is it funds, it provides extra funds for transit to make sure to close that maintenance backlog and bring our transit up to modern standards and make sure to address those safety and reliability issues. Um, I, I'll mention a couple of my bills that, that didn't pass, but um, that I'll certainly be bringing back next year. One of them is the um, Transportation Equity Act. Um, it actually had a longer title, but we just called it the Transportation Equity Act. So there's um, there's a, a history of um, disparate de decisions um, that that impact that impact our, our transportation, from the the cancellation of the red line um, to highways built through black communities, low income communities, um, impact on people with disabilities. So this Transportation Equity Act, which I introduced would create a commission on transportation equity um, and that would advise MDOT on making sure that all transportation in the state is equitable. Um, it would require collecting data on the impact of transportation on um, racial disparities and also on people with disabilities. And it would have strengthened Title VI provisions um, that, that um, in terms of making sure that transportation decisions don't have a disparate impact. Um, it, it had huge support. It was supported by the NAACP, by environmental groups, by labor groups, by the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church. Um, a, a huge number of groups statewide supported it. There was no opposition. Um, the biggest problem with it was that the fiscal cost I worked with MDOT to bring that that cost down, but by the time we got to that point, we just ran out of time and there wasn't time for it to pass. So I'm going to be bringing that back next year in the revised form after I worked with MDOT on that, and, and I, I'm very optimistic that it's, it's going to pass next year. One other bill that I introduced, um, HB 700, it, it would have, um, so there there is a law that makes it a misdemeanor to disturb class. Um, and so what this does is it criminalizes typical adolescent behavior where where teens can be actually charged with a crime for for things like yelling at a teacher, storming out of class, things that teens do. And it's not right that they do that, but that's not something that they should be um, you know, put into the criminal justice system for. You know, teens' brains are not fully developed really until they're 25. Um, and so, and, and this law was really never intended to be used in this way. They were introduced in the, the late 1960s around the country, really um, to, to prevent student protests. And it was only in the 1990s that they started being used for internal school discipline. So HB 700, I initially put it in as a, as a repeal of the law. Um, and uh, there was some opposition from like the colleges concerned about outside agitators and their ability to deal with that. So I amended the bill to um, instead of a repeal, just say that students can't be charged under this bill because it was really the students were trying to protect um, these. This is a factor in the school to prison pipeline um, and 82% of the students charged under this law are black students and students of color. So it, it actually passed the full house. Um, and went over to the Senate, but it didn't get a vote in the Senate. So I'll definitely be bringing that one back next year. So I think I've used up my five minutes and happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the questions you did already answer that was, um, was there any legislation proposed to address climate change? And I believe you answered that uh, very well. Um, seemed like some good, in, um, some good bills there. Did anyone have any questions about that particular question? Okay. Um, so I'll ask this um, when I know you're you're short on time. What legislation are you most proud of in this past legislative session? 
Well, th thank you for that question. And uh, definitely the, the Transportation Equity Act, which um, I mentioned, is one that I really worked hard on um, for took about six months developing it. And, and I think it's going to really make a difference and I'm very proud of it and hope that we can get it passed. Um, an another one that I'm very proud of that I didn't mention is one that would help reduce contact with the police for people in mental health crisis. Um, because right now what happens, um, someone is in mental health crisis um, that uh, they there can be an emergency petition to take them to the hospital to be evaluated to see if they're a danger to themselves or others. Right now, that emergency petition can be written by the courts or it can be written by um, the police or it can be written by a mental health professional, a psychiatrist, social, social, social worker, sorry, psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker. Um, but if a mental health professional writes the emergency petition, they still have to call the police to take that person to the emergency room. That's in the law. They're required to call the police. And, and the problem is the police aren't always the best people to deal with someone in mental health crisis. Um, you know, I know the Baltimore County Police um, have training uh, and some of the other counties do also have training, which is great. Um, and I know that, that the police do a great job, you know, when they can, um, but it, it just doesn't equal the years of education and experience that a psychiatrist or a psychologist um, or a social worker has. So what this bill would have done, would have, it would let those mental health professionals use their professional discretion as to whether the police are needed in any given situation. If, if someone is, um, you know, violent or a danger, then, then yes, we want the police involved. But if it's more a case where they're suicidal, it might be more traumatic to that person to, to have the police involved. So that was one. And what I'm particularly proud on that is we worked with with many different groups and stakeholders to, to really refine the bill and make it better after it was introduced. And I think it's a much stronger bill for all that work. Um, I, again, it didn't pass, but um, I, I certainly will be, you know, looking at bringing it back next year. Okay, thank you. Let's see. One last question for you, and I'll I'll let you go. Um, let's see, since the 2020 census is complete, do you anticipate any redistricting on the state and county level, and how will it affect us? Yeah, I mean, I I do I do think that there's going to be redistricting. Um, uh, I can speak more on the the state level than than the county level. Um, you know, the, the biggest problem is the census data is delayed and I think we're not expected to get the census data in September. So it's really, um, it's going to have to be rushed um, to, to figure out the redistricting. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but, um, you know, the, the, the governor will introduce his redistricting bill by the first day of the session. He's required under the Constitution to introduce it by the first day of the legislative session. Then the legislature has 45 days to um, come up with their own and pass their own redistricting bill. And if we don't, then the governor's bill goes into effect. Um, and the, uh, I know the governor has appointed an independent commission for that. I, I don't know, you know what, what's going to happen or how things are going to work. One thing that um, I'm really interested to see is with District 44, if they change it. So because right now it's split between the city and the county. Um, I represent the county part, but um, Senator Sidnor represents both the city and the county. And um, uh, Mr. Clark may may address that later. I, I, I'm not sure, but you know that'll be an interesting thing to look for to see how that um, impacts our our districts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody have any questions? No. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Herman Jones, Maple Hill Crone Association. Hey, Herman. How you doing? Uh, Senator, as far as uh, the redistricting of 44B, how far will that go up as 44? I, I really couldn't tell you. It's it's just going to depend on the census data, and, and I really don't know the answer to that. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it'll just it's something to watch is all I can say. We, we won't really know until we get the census data. Okay. Sorry, okay. I can't give you a better answer. 
Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you, Delegate Ruth. I know your time is short. Um, thank you so much. So feel free to um, jump out whenever you feel like it. Um, and we'll catch up with you later on um, during the year um, to talk specifically about um, environmental issues. That sounds great. That sounds great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for coming. Okay, let's see. We have Mr. Eugene Clark, um, who is with Senator Sid Nor's office. Um, he's going to introduce himself and um, you have five minutes to tell us what's going on, like Marvin Gaye. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. I'm Eugene Clark, and I'm the uh, Chief of Staff for Senator Charles Hitnar. He, of course, uh, is the senator who represents District 44, which includes uh, portions of Baltimore City and, of course, uh, 44 B in Baltimore County. Uh, the senator, of course, is, uh, is in this evening, so he asked me, of course, to bring, to bring forth, of course, greetings and to let you know that, of course, that uh, uh, we appreciate uh, all that, that you are doing in terms of getting this out. And, and, of course, during my particular uh, presentation, we'll also probably provide you with a, a, a few challenges. Or words has been a uh, very challenging session, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, Delegate Roof has indicated. You know, we started, and of course, that uh, uh, because we didn't know what COVID what was going to do, uh, the lockdown at the at the legislature. Uh, we've been on Zoom, of course, uh, for the last past almost a year now. A, a, a year now, we've been on Zoom, Zoom doing meetings all all over the uh, the uh, district and in the entire state. One of the things that we want to say that we we do appreciate the support, in particular that of uh, of of your of your president Brian Glass. He's always so. Uh, involved and on this thing and, and provides us with information that pertains to our, to our district and of course to your communities and so we're just happy that we are able to have that kind of relationship so that everybody is uh is is, is abreast of what's going on even though we were kind of consumed over that 90 days over that 90 days uh for this session uh we in, in maryland of course we look just like the rest of the nation in terms of the uh, uh, for what has been happening. Since the start of this journey last year, we were focused in terms of the pandemic and un unemployment. That's with the moved uh, with, with the death of George Floyd. Over, over to him focusing on on the, uh, uh, police accountability and, and criminal justice. We moved from from uh, through that process in September. There was a number of uh, uh, that was four days of hearings held by the uh, Judicial Proceedings uh, Committee over the Senate had to do with police accountability bills that would be forthcoming for the session. Senator Sitka was assigned four of those uh, 15 or so bills that were that were put forward. Uh, of that number, of course, uh, 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 just about all of the things that were included in those four bills were, were passed in one form or, or the other during the legislative session. And he was very, very proud in terms of that. The one that most people would probably think of would be his uh, Senate bill number 71, which he sponsored. That one changed the entire uh, process or outlook having to do with uh, police accountability. And that it took away that, that, that which we have, have heard even in the George Floyd case having to do with the uh, uh, police personal perception of what was going on and then and let that be the standard having to do with what the actions that the police officer actually took. And what this, what that bill does and in part is to make it so that it's not what the police officer himself thought uh, was going on. It was, it's the matter of the actions he took as a result of what was going on. And in that sense, of course, you know, you, 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 you look at the police accountability in terms of what did, what did you do in certain situations based upon the training, which was also covered in that bill, uh, of, of resources available, all the things that a professional police officer should, should engage in terms of be trained in as, as, they, as they go forward. The other thing that he's very proud of is that he had a workshop 
or a work group that is that went forward this past uh, uh, last sept from September through uh, in, into the session dealing with forensic forensic genetic genealogy, which has to do with those things that you hear on ancestor.com, et cetera, what have you. And that in that bill, he, he he engaged a group of about 13 or so persons, including uh, Barry Sheck of the Innocent Project, who's probably the most famous having to do with the O.J. Simpson trial. And all of us got together in, in terms of C.C. Moore, uh, who is uh, the, the, the lead professional in that area. And we talked about and dealt with what would it take in terms of to make level of accountability with respect to privacy, Fourth Amendment rights, and so with respect to how people access your genetic uh, 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 DNA. So that, that's, that's one of the things that did pass and that he's very so proud of uh, this, past, this past session. So with uh, that in mind, I'm going to uh, 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 look to, of uh, course, your questions. But I guess I need to say, as Sheila had said, he was also the, 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 the lead sponsor of Senate Bill 1. Senate Bill 1 was the uh, 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 Black Colleges and Universities Funding Bill. That is the HBCU bill that, in fact, that was vetoed by the governor last, last year. That was brought back be, uh, better uh, this year. And, if, and they, they, the better part of it was a level of accounting uh, in that it had a, a portion that paid for, that pays for the bill. And it had also another portion that uh, uh, up the amount of money that Coppin State University would receive through, throughout the 10-year uh, period. That bill passed uh, in the Senate 47 to nothing. It was signed into law by the uh, by the uh, governor. It was March 20, 24th at, uh, at Boise State U University. So it is in fact now law. And uh, the senator is now engaged in mediating, of course, the, the, the final leg of the settlement between the coalition and of course the, the, attorney, the, the attorney general for the state of Maryland, uh, Brian Frosch. So there he's engaged in that even even uh, 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 this th this week and last night. So those are the major, I think you would call, accomplishments that, that we believe that uh, speaks to, to what it is that, that we're doing. But you're also going to receive in the next few days or so a news, a, a, uh, what we call our intercession letter, which is going to highlight for you, of course, the bills and things that, that sponsored, those that passed, those that didn't, those that he intend to bring back, of course, next session. It will also include in that in that uh, 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 newsletter those things that uh, that you will see that in terms of funding, he was he uh, was able to get through uh, a, a number of, of, of what they call bond bill uh, bond initiatives. Uh, so for our district, both for the city and for the county, and so those things you will read about, and that would be inclusive of the three million dollars that would be spent on expanding the. Uh, Woodlawn Senior Center. Uh, uh, the state would be paying three million dollars of the poor of the four point six million dollars that has been that has been budgeted for that particular project. So, so those are the kinds of things that he worked on throughout the uh, throughout the session. And so, we'll be happy, of course, to 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 alert to to answer any questions that that you may have. And I know that there are some that has to do with legislation pertaining to uh, the environment and, and other and other in other situations. And with that one, I can tell you that with respect to climate change, as I won't repeat what's in it, what the Delegate Roof has already said, but just to let you know that there were a few things that, that did pass uh, that, that she may not have, have spoken to. And one of them was, of course, uh, the uh, uh, to protect the environment this session, the, uh, they removed uh, black liquor from the Maryland subsidized re renewable energy portfolio standards. That black liquid, that is the, that is the chemical byproduct of producing paper. That's, that's what that black liquor is, is, is talking about. And so that was removed and they invested in solar and solar and, and hydropower and Senate bill 65 had uh, uh, geothermal heating and cooling systems to our, to our uh, energy portfolio standards. And, uh, and and they advanced, of course, the standalone legislation to move our public transit fleet to zero emissions uh, of, of, of vehicles. So those are some of the things that happened 
having to do with the uh, the, the, the environmental issues that would be so important to, to all, all of us. Um, Brian, any questions? Thank you, sir. We have uh, one question. Um, how will we receive this newsletter? You will, those of you who, who have contacted the, uh, our office, the Senate office, uh, we are, I am literally mailing those out to the bulk of those tomorrow. You will receive those via the mail. Those of you who have contacted, contacted uh, the senator via uh, uh, his uh, uh, elect Charles Sidnor uh, uh, account in Europe, and, and you get our newsletter every uh, 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 every time we put out one, then you would automatically receive one. Then, so if you're on that 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 e either or, you will get the electronic version that way, and you will get a hard copy through the U.S. mail if you have contacted our office in Indianapolis. And of course, I know Brian, of course, has, so he's gonna get a hard copy because I saw his name. <laughs> and <that's, laughs> we would be putting that in the mail to him. Uh, you know, that I, I, I do know. So that I will be, I'll be mailing those out tomorrow. And so you should get them, uh, I would say by Wednesday next week. Okay, thank you. Um, and just to let you all know, now I put a uh, message in the chat box. Um, whenever they send me legislative updates and information like that, I usually transform them into the uh, form of a blog article for the uh, 4410 uh, website. Um, so that'll be no difference. When we get that information in, I'll put it right on the front page of the um, website so everybody can um, read the information and also download the, um, the newsletter themselves. Okay, so that'll, that'll cover, you know, those who are not on your list, if they're connected to that website, they can get it as well. Right. One of the things I would like to add, though, is that we are always looking for a response. That the same way that you ask us, what have we done? Uh, we always we're always look, looking forward to ask ask those in our, our constituencies, what have you done to help us move it move legislation along? What have you done in terms of to uh, move, in fact, the county budget along? We have serious issues having to do with our, our budgeting process in Baltimore, in Baltimore County. What is being budgeted? What is not? But unless they hear from you during the budget process or sometime during that year, the answer is your needs are not going to be met. We do certain things even at the state level. For example, one of the things you're going to read about in the newsletter is that we're having the, uh, the, uh, 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 our department of uh, uh, one of those departments that deals with, our, with the Patapsco State Park. We're having that department to report back to the senator, the first, the first of us, First of September, having to do with uh, parking there. We've had a number of complaints over there having to do with just the matter of people going over there to take a walk through the park or on the tr on the jogging trails or so that cannot find parking. So we're having we're having them to report back to us exactly what they're doing in order to 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 improve that situation and bring us a a, a program or, or 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 some type of a proposal in order so that we can address it through legislation or not. So those are the thing, kind of things that when we hear from people like that, those people who walk in the park, we know that there's going to be some 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 money going over to uh, the uh, uh, Gwen Oak Trail. We know we, we know that going. So so when they come to us in terms of the the departments or so uh, 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 for Van Bottom, uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development, which funds some of those grants, Department of uh, 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 environment, so that may be doing something. We're trying to do something of, of a study over at Woodlawn High School. Woodlawn High School, the playing fields are built on a floodplain. We're trying. We 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 are. Uh, the senator has put in money last year for to study those floodplains so that we can get those those playing fields back into playing order, playing order for 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 our players and our and our students. So so. Right now, they can't even practice on their own uh, home field. They don't have any home field advantage because they can't, the, 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 it's such that it's unplayable there. So we're trying to address those kinds of needs and we really do need our community uh, per partners to, to step up and, 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 and bring us those issues so that we can look at them and address some of them because otherwise we will not know about them unless you are engaged and tell us, this is what is going on in my neighborhood. And so that we can bring forth the kinds of remedies, whether it, whether it be at the county level or either at the state level, that would improve for all of us. Of course, 
in particular for our students, uh, that which is going on. Right now, I have, I have uh, the Senator has, we have uh, expanded the, uh, uh, the date in which students are going to be able to, to send back to us the, uh, their scholarship information uh, applications for this year. Those graduating seniors from high school, we would love to have far more of them to access for to access the money that we're going to have available for them to go to college for the next four, four years. Well, guess what? When I called Woodline about the time that our, 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 our deadline was approaching, they told me, I said, well, how many do you have? They said they had one student. <laughs> graduated well, senior that's going to go to school, go, go to higher education in the state of Maryland that may be applying. That's not sufficient for us. That means that there's a, a downside either among the community associations, the, the PTA, and of course the parents, because students, they don't care that their parents have to pay extra if they don't get a scholarship. All they want to do is go to school. So it's gonna be up to all of us to encourage those parents who have students in school graduating seniors in particular, those are the ones that we're most concerned with. Because if the Senator gives them $1,000 this year, guess what? They'll get $1,000 for the next three years as well. That means a total of $4,000 on the Senate side, as opposed to if we were on the House side, they had to apply year after year. So once we award them, they are awarded for, four, for, for a four year ride. So this is what we're talking about in getting those resources out to those students and parents or so who tell us that they, are, that they really need some more funds. And we have funds available that we would like to share, but we can't share them if you don't apply. And that's what we, we need your help with in terms of getting that, that, uh, that message out. Thank you. Okay, we can do so. Um, I see Alicia McCaskill has a question. I got a question. You're muted. Somebody's muted. Can I, oh. Herman Jones, when I get a chance. Okay. Um, where's uh, He's Mr. Catskill? Are you still there? Just can't hear. Oh, can you can you hear it? We can't hear you. You can put it in the chat box. Put your question in the chat box. Um, Herman Moore. I mean, excuse me, that's a football player. <laughs> Herman Johnson, are you here? Herman Jones. Herman Jones, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Clark. Yes, sir. The, who do you hold accountability to uh, getting this information out to the teachers, I mean, to the students? of the school i mean is there counselors in there in the schools to, to, to get hold of these students that's my first question and um is the principal or the counselor have anything to do with uh getting the, uh, this information out to the students or yes to the in, yes in, in, in both instances what we do is we send out the uh the uh, actual application to the schools and even in this time of COVID, we sent out the uh the actual uh application we sent out the link for the application to the principals we don't send them to the counselors because the counselors may in fact change the principal's responsibility is to get that information to their school counselors a couple of our schools in our district in baltimore county they they do very well having to do with getting their school their their, their children involved getting their applications in and i can tell you those two are, are going to be western tech uh we every year we get 10 12 applications from western tech period no matter what and many of those students of course are not residents of district 44 but but again the the counselor over there and the principal make sure that they have all the students have the applications done 
they, they have the uh, the, uh, the their uh, their letters of recommendation done. They have, of course, the transcripts in, in the package, and the packages are mailed off the way they're supposed to. And similar to that, of course, is Cadesville High School. Our downfall is that Woodlawn High School that we have in the district and, and Milford Mill. We're not getting those kinds of responses from those two schools. And we and this is nothing new. We we didn't get them uh, the, the numbers that we would reasonably expect even when he was a delegate. And now that we have even more resources to share, we would certainly we know that there was COVID last year when he first came became a senator. We know that was uh, but even last year we had 25 at least 25 uh, high schoolers to apply and to and, 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 and to be awarded. So, 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 yes, it starts with the school, but, but, but what I'm saying to you is that in my conversation with the schools, the schools deal with the, with, with the students, but unless there's pressure by the parents or so, or by the school administrator, administrator, so ensure that that is at the top of the list for their school counselors to perform those kinds of, 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 of functions, then it's not going to happen because the students are not aware, they're not engaged, and right. for whatever reason, they're just simply focused on, I'm, I'm going to graduate and let me out of here, you know, and let me go on to, to, to the next level. Oh, okay. Um, my second question is, as, as far as DP, the public works, um, as far as money, uh, I'm in a neighborhood where I, have been, I approached uh, Senator Signal and uh, uh, Julius Jones, and when they was working on this hill down between Woodlawn Drive and up to Featherbed, we, we doing the street. And I asked the question, I think it's DP uh, worker, what's his name, Mr. Williams, I think it is. Well, well, he came up in the neighborhood, but he also explained to me that, man, five years ago, I, I, I've been, been barking about the neighborhood, how the street needs to be redone. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm talking to the right person there or not, but I did talk to Senator Fidno about it. And then I talked to Mr. Williams, and he says, well, they're waiting for money to, to, to come out. Now, I understand that I've been on a waiting list for almost five years. Ever since, they've been talking about re, uh, advertising the, the, the sidewalks on Windsor Mill. And I know they have done several uh streets up past my, my my neighborhood and never came up in here knowing that it's been beat up. So I've been complaining for the last five years, knowing that I've been up here for the last 40 years, ain't nobody been here. And now really the street is really beat up. So what's, well, what's, okay. what's, well, what's, what's like going all I can All I can ask you to do is uh, send us an email to our, to our email address. Give me your address and the street that you're referring to. And then, and, and of course, with your identified information, uh, phone number, what have you, we will in fact get you those answers from uh, from uh, Department of Public Works. That's how we do it. All right. Okay, so um, we have Councilman uh, Julian Jones uh, here. So I'm gonna let him jump in there uh, real quick. And, Can I uh, ask um, a question to Mr. Clark before Councilman Jones comes in though? I put it in the chat. And this is Alethea. Can you hear me now? I switched devices before she started talking. I just want to make sure. Okay, because I do have a question for uh, Mr. Clark also before he leaves. I'm sorry, ma'am. Okay, so um, we'll go. I know you was waiting. Um, we'll, we'll go with your question and then we'll let Ms. Uh, Belinda Merrick. Yes, thank you. Okay, Ms. McCaskill, where was your, your question? Oh, she could have gone ahead, but okay, um, I won't take. Uh, Mr. Clark, good evening to you. Good evening. My question and co comment is for the scholarships. I had mentioned it before when Senator Pulley, um, when Shirley Nathan Pulliam was the senator. And just a suggestion, I know it's been really hard. Um, I hear everybody's side. As a parent, my daughters both were recipients of the senatorial and the delegate scholarships, and they were a big help. Um, and the process is not, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not too hard to do, but I too had to find the scholarships, you know, 
I had to find them. They weren't as readily to the school and they went to Western and Milford. So mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what the PR side is from the delegate or the senator um, offices to get this to. I heard, you know, you tell us the process, but just as a suggestion, because it is a financial strain on the parents and they would love mm -hmm. to have all the help and the children don't always understand the cost of college. But just as a PR move from your office and mm -hmm. from the delegate office, but from the senator's office, if you all could possibly think about how to um, get that information into the offices earlier, um, because when I went to Milford for my daughter, and this was in September prior to, they never even mentioned the senatorial scholarship. I happened to be doing some research to find it. Um, and so it's just not as easy. It's easily accessible once you know about it, but that's just like a commercial. You got to advertise it. So maybe just as a suggestion from the senatorial's um office if you all to think about how to promote even you know promote it a little bit better that it's here guys um you know maybe not wait till march or february to you know whenever it's released because i can't remember it's been some years now but whenever it's released like kind of have it to the offices sooner or whatever some flyers um put it up on your websites or whatever but maybe that's just something we should you know you can think about as far as how to promote those scholarships so that parents and the community can know a little bit better i know it's our responsibility i did my part i finally found it it took me a while <laughs> And then the schools weren't any help as much as well either. So I think too, if we finding that the schools are not getting the information out um, like they should, the counselor's not, you know, doing or whatever the breakdown of communication is, maybe you all can find a way to help promote it um, as well. Even if putting it in, making, you know, putting flyers out in the community centers and everything. Now Brian has this forty four ten. Maybe we can start posting something there when the, um, you know, when the scholarships are released. But it is not easy to find, and a lot of people don't know about it because. It's not a good PR move for it. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, I can respond to you a little bit about that. Is that one? It is on the uh, on the, on the senator's website. If you go to elect uh, Sen uh, Charles Sidnor dot uh, org, Charles, mm -hmm. you, you're you're going to find it there. You're going to find it in terms of every publication newsletter that we print out. We put out. We're going to be talk. We talk about our scholarship and pro and our program uh, at, at that particular juncture. Uh, uh, the only place that we don't talk about it is in our uh, intercession letter, simply because uh, it is not one of those kinds of items that 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 you can put in there. We're restricted by by law in terms of what we can say in terms of that particular publication because it is done by the state of Maryland. But it will be again in our uh, in our newsletter that's coming out the first part part of May. We're going to be announcing it uh, again. We've um, I, I, I put out emails back to the school. We put it back out on social media. We have social media platforms uh, on, on, on Twitter. You know, all the other stuff that everybody else has. We put it. We were we re announced it again out there. And so to the extent and we, of course, send it back out to every every high school that there was. So 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 every 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 school counselor in the state of Maryland knows about this delegate and senatorial scholarships because it's been a part of the law and there's things that all the scholarship aid that is in the Berlin Higher Education Commission's uh, bevy, it is one of those components that's in there. And I really would suggest to, to, to parents and even, even to uh, community associations. I, I have done workshops. Matter of fact, the last one I did was the uh, first part of this year for the NWCP out here in, in Baltimore County. We do workshops in terms of those who ask us having to do for parents, having to do with all the scholarships that are available, not just ours. There are scholarships that, that kids can have. And I see some that they're getting three and four, five thousand dollars a year, and sometimes up up to up to ten ten thousand dollars a year. Scholarship aid from the state of Maryland that's available if you go on the Maryland Higher Education Commission website. But in, but as you say, unless you know that. And that until communities start to engage and get involved and parents involved and in saying that we need to be talking about these things come September, October, November and engage us because we do fraternal fraternity sorority workshops. We do all the things that, that we, we can do that, that 
that we're invited to in order to talk about those programs. And I have known them and I have talked about them. You know, <laughs> even in writing, we have the stuff, I have it laid out in writing all. Of, so, I mean, you know, we try as best we can to do all that we can. But again, when you only got a staff of, 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 of limited staff in terms of what the state has, is not like even the county councils. We don't even have their level of staffing. So, so to the extent that we have that level of staffing, we really don't. And so, and this has been a particular part here, simply because in Annapolis, we can only have uh, one staff person in the office. At, uh, at, at uh, so, so that's how we worked it this year. It's been very difficult, but again, we try to get it to everybody who would listen to us. But the problem is even with the schools, they were on, co on COVID and working from wherever. So they did not engage their students like they would have ordinarily this year. That's the reason we extended the, uh, the, the amount of time they had to respond over to, uh, you know, for, for another month because we knew that they had just opened up the schools for our students to come back in. And even with that, only, only a few students were showing up in terms of actual class time. So, so we're going to continue trying to get the word out as best that we can. That's when I'm, I'm asking you all as a community association to engage in terms of your community so that they'll know about it and then they can ask about it. We can do workshops on it. We can do whatever that we need to do so that parents and children would know that these funds are in fact uh, uh, available. And we used to give out last year, I think it was about, we, we handed out about $45,000 last year. So I don't know how much we're going to get uh, this year. We, we don't know how much we're going to get until the, the, the month of May. So that's how, that's how we get our information having to do with the amount of funding. Uh, it's not really available even to us. So that's in, in, our, in, our, in our processes with respect to that is that we have to rely, wait until we know where we're going to be sitting the next year before we put out something having to do with even the formal application. Because, uh, 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 you know, obviously, like last year, we had to wait until the senator took his seat in January, on January 8th, before we could talk about a senatorial scholarship, because otherwise he was in the House of Delegates. So it's okay. a whole different process. We appreciate it. One last thing. Does the money roll over to the next year's scholarship or once it's one and done? It's just each fiscal year is what's available. Does the money was not used? Is it, does it roll over to the next year? Right. Any money that I did not that was not used and I that was budgeted for us, we will we will have it available this year. And okay. yeah, so 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 yeah, we, we, okay. we give out we go we give out every dollar that we can and uh and so you know and we just we want our students to be to, to be successful. Good deal. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um last question. Um because we, we do have some uh questions that we had you know pre-made. Um Ms. Merrick, you have a question? Yes, um, I'll be brief. Um, how you doing, Mr. Clark? Um, how you I doing? wanted to know if you had any information on uh if uh the trees would be replanted on Northern Parkway where they, they're putting in the pipes for I guess for sanitation pipes and water, or will there be apartment buildings built there? I I would have no information to share with you about Northern Parkway because that is not in our district. Uh, our, our, our portion of the of the uh, Bal uh, Baltimore County, uh, uh, Baltimore City District, goes flows uh, up and down uh, Frederick Road is the is the primary art artery back into the central city in terms of uh, all the way over to, to Utah Place. So that is the direction in which our, our district flows, as opposed to uh, picking up the district in and around the uh, Northern Parkway areas. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. Do you know who I could ask that question to? Oh, I really don't. I I would. Uh, um, um, but if it's but if you're talking about trees planted in 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 the, in, the, in Baltimore City and and on uh, Northern Parkway, I would I would suggest that you contact the Baltimore City Department of Public Works. They would have the answer for you. Okay, I appreciate that because I noticed they've taken down a lot of trees. Um, I know that they've also taken down trees and um, uprooted grass on Grendel, but I've noticed that they've since replanted the grass and as well as the trees that were taken down. I was just curious because I live right inside of the Baltimore County line. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I, I've heard so many rumors that uh, uh, 
apartment buildings will be built there or they will be planting the trees. I just thought that you wouldn't know, but mm -hmm. I thank you for that. Thank you. Take care. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, we're going to thank you. introduce our uh, fourth district councilman, um, chairman of the Baltimore County Council, uh, Julian Jones. You have the floor. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you for having me, and uh, it's good to see everyone this evening. And uh, I know that uh, one of the questions you had asked me about earlier, so I'll get that out of the way, was about the beautification of Liberty Road. Uh, you know, Liberty Road has been an ongoing uh, project for many years. I was able to help secure the fund putting up, the, you know, doing the beautification in steps and phases, and we're still not done. And I know the latest part with the lights, I think we've done the lights now. The latest part was to get all the lights below the beltway. So now if you go up and down Liberty Road, you see the beautiful uh, uh, lights. They sort of like, they give off some light, but they're really decorative for the most part. If we didn't have the big street lights, they would give off more light or you would think they would. Uh, the next project of that, or the next part of that project is uh, trying to do something with the big uh, retaining walls coming into the county, trying to beautify those. Uh, right now, if that sort of stuck with uh, an issue with the state highway, what I would like to do is to put bricks, a brick veneer on the outside of that wall to dress it up and put a few sconces. Uh, right now, the state highway administration don't want us to touch that wall at all. So um, we're going to see how that's going to work. Just, you know, the state highway administration, you know, we've been working with them an awful lot. Uh, we would have run out of money if we put the lights up at night like they wanted. Inside the Beltway, they were insisting that we only do those at night. That took a couple of months to get fixed where we are allowed to put them up during the day because it costs so much more money to put them up at night. Uh, on that note, I heard somebody talking about the Windsor Mill Road project. That project is certainly, it, it always takes, when you have a project of that size, it always takes at a minimum of five to six years. And that project started back in 2015. I actually put it on the table in like 2014 when I first took off. And at that time, we were trying basically Robin Peter to pay Paul. I mean, we were stretching these projects out and certain things were only being done in the off year. But at that particular time, we we did uh, engineering work and then things got tight and we ended up not doing anything else. Uh, John Oshesky administration came in. We were uh, fortunate enough to raise taxes. So now uh, we have that money. So now that project is on the fast track and we hope to have that done in you know, three different phases, but certainly hopefully to have the first phase done in five to six years. And people may wonder why does it take so long? Well, first, you have to do the engineering work. That normally takes a year. Second, you have to acquire the property. Once you identify the properties that you need to buy from the resident. And what normally happens is every resident wanna wait and be the last one to sign because they think that they're gonna get more money if they're last. So people are not in a hurry to, to sign and sell their property to the county. And then, uh, then the next part, and all along, by the way, we try not to do any more work on the road. We're not trying to pave the road, but we're going to tear it up in a couple of years. Um, so then, you know, at some point we have to move the utilities and we give notice to Baltimore City and anybody with a pipe under the ground to say, if you need to replace that pipe, do that now. So that's some of the things that have to happen before you actually get into widening the road and putting down new asphalt. So, uh, that's, that's what's happening there. Like the first phase is from Woodlawn Drive to Featherbed Lane. The second phase from Featherbed Lane to uh, Baltimore Boulevard, uh, right on the other side of the Beltway. And then the third part is from there all the way up to Rolling Road. So that's, that's the phase there. Um, now, at this note, I will, you know, take any questions we have just to try to be quicker and be more responsive instead of talking about things people don't want to hear about. 
I got okay. one, Herman. Wait a minute, Herman wait a minute. Jones. Yes. Hold on, hold on, Herman. <laughs> we're we're going to go. We have these uh, pre made questions, so we want to get through these questions first. Then at the end, we'll, you know, add in the um, other questions. Um, we have <clears throat> the, you answered one of them, which was, uh, uh, what was being done to beautify the Liberty River Corridor from Northern Parkway to 695? Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question that asked, can we explore stiffening the penalties in regards to uh, reckless pet owners? We certainly can explore it. I don't know. I don't know what you mean by reckless pet owners. Uh, what behavior are we talking about? So. so Specific, I know recently um, one of the residents um, had her dog attacked by another um, community resident's dogs, um, causing a lot of damage. And um, to add on to that, I got bit by a dog last uh, was it Friday. <laughs> I got yeah, got bit on the leg by a dog. Um, really? Yeah, pit bull, white pit bull named Bella. <laughs> so she. Apparently the dog kept getting out. I guess that's, I guess that's her third time getting out of the, uh, the pen. And this particular time she got me good. Um, not a big deal, but um, those those things happen. And um, the question was asked because they feel that if penalties were more stiff, people would take uh, better care or pay more attention to um, their pet. Well, what I would ask people to do is Make sure they report these incidents because um, we have some pretty, you know, some pretty stiff penalties now, believe it or not, in terms of uh, people allowing their dogs to get out, uh, even up to, I think, even taking their dogs. But uh, also, the other, the other part to that is there's also civil penalties that a person can take. I mean, a person can take civil action against somebody if their dog bite them or get out and attack their dog. So... You know, I don't mind looking into that, but I know that this is an issue that we had before, and I believe we did stiffen the penalties there, but the important thing is for people to report it. Okay. Um, Ms. Honecker, you had a question in regards to that? Mr. Jones, the pets didn't belong to the homeowner. They were, like, rent an apartment there. And in their yard, if you go in their yard, the back is covered with chicken pens, but the front of the pens don't. There's no defense. So these dogs got out and tore poor Sarah apart. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and there's got to be a simple penalty for the person that is not their dogs, saying it's not their dogs. They got they went to Pasadena. For the person that owns that house, has to have a simple penalty for that person. Okay. Point well taken. I mean, we can talk to Dr. Branch and see uh, you know, whether or not there's something we can do about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go back up to the top. Um, what legislation are you most proud of in this past legislative session? That was actually geared toward our delegates, but um, you can answer that as well. Well, you know, I'm, you know if I look at uh, probably my career and you know, past legislative, I mean, our, our session always, we never stop, right? So it's not like we have a session, we just keep going. But some of the things I'm most proud of is the College Promise Program. We're talking about uh, free college tuition here inside Baltimore County. Uh, that's something I'm extremely proud of. Uh, the police reform legislation, I think that that was sensible, reasonable reforms. Uh, and uh, let me see what else. And of course, all the things we've been doing lately during COVID to keep businesses afloat, and they keep food on the table for a lot of people. So um, those are things that I'm very, very proud. Of. Okay. So many things, it's hard for me to say, really, but I, I have quite a few of them, whether it be the sewer bill reform, stopping people from losing their house because of erroneous sewer bill, uh, you name it. I have a, a long, extensive list. <laughs> so, okay, next, next question is, um, the perception is that educational standards have been steadily decreasing in Baltimore County. What, if anything, is being done to address that? Well, you know, that's a good question, but I can tell you 
I don't think the standards have been decreased. Uh, Baltimore County Public Schools have been under tremendous, tremendous stress. Uh, every school system has been under stress. We are very fortunate in Baltimore County that each one of our students had a computer at the beginning of, before COVID got here, we had invested in computers. Then COVID got here and what a lot of people don't understand is the school system really has been playing catch up. You know, when we closed Baltimore County Public Schools, Baltimore County Public Schools had about one and a half day notice from the governor's office that this is what we're going to do. So at that moment, we had to turn around and go totally virtual. And right now schools are open, not because Baltimore County Public Schools said schools should open, the governor and the state superintendent of schools said, you're going to open schools. You're going to come up with some plan and let me see a plan and now open the schools. So, you know, and then on top of that, we got a ransomware attack. And all, you know, so Baltimore County Public Schools have been taking it on the chin. And uh, what's really sad to me is we only have one school system. I'm all for improving anything. I, if there's a problem, I'm all for making an improvement. If you look at my career here on the council, I've always worked hard to make improvements. But we must never forget, we only have one school system in Baltimore County. So let's not try to burn it down or tear it down. We have to be supportive. We can, we can make suggestions for improvement, but we can't tear it down. And uh, right now, the teachers have been doing their very best. Uh, you know, some of the decisions were made. I wouldn't agree with them, but I'm not the superintendent of schools or the school board. And people got to remember, the superintendent of schools, he answers to the school board. And if you look at the, what's happening with the school board, I'm just going to say, to put it mildly, they have not been very congenial or they haven't been very kind to one another. And I don't think that that type of bickering back and forth is... Uh, helpful to our school system or the students who they are charged to educate. And I give you one analogy. If you have a mother and a father, and these are two different sides of, of the coin here as it relates to members on the school board, and you have a sick child in the back of the car, and the father says, I think we should go left. That's a shortcut. And the mother says, no, I should go right. And they get to the fork in the road and they stop there and fight about which way is the best way. Meanwhile, the kid is in the back of the car suffering. At some point, somebody has to say, just go your way because it'll be better for the kid and I may not get my way on this one, but just go your way until we get the kid to the hospital. Right now, they come to a fork in the road, they just fight. There's a group of people, I'm just gonna be straight, there's a group of people who just, they, they don't like computers for kids. They, they, they don't, they, they're, not, they're not being helpful. And these people are just fighting. And it's not helpful to the kids or the school system. So it doesn't, doesn't surprise me that somebody would say the school system is going down. Because if you look at anything that's going on, if you look at the news, if you look at Facebook, if you look at what's going on, you would come to that conclusion for sure. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, the last one for you. Um... And I guess we have uh, one other for Mr. Clark, if he's still here. Um, what can be done to better regulate the placement of methadone clinics near residential areas? Well, I tell you, um, these issues are totally state issues. Uh, the state regulates them. The state gives them the license. And in some ways, the state has no interest in being open to Baltimore County, I should say it. Um, I have been pushing for legislation at a state level to regulate some of these issues, as well as uh, regulate the proximity of one group home to another. Because I have blocks where four to five group homes are in one block. And I would like to have 1,500 feet difference between one and another, just to make sure that no one community or one block ends up with three or four or five of them. So that's, that's, these are state level issues. I, I've been doing as much as I can 
to uh, uh, to try to change the way these things are, are put in place is very difficult for me as a council member. I know the stress that it puts on the community. And I also know that, you know, some of the reasons they take it out of my hand is because they know that people like me being responsive to the community wouldn't want them in our community. And the need is there for them to be someplace. And I'm okay. I guess don't want them to. I don't. I want to make sure that everybody share the, the the burden, if you will, and not one community be the one who gets it all the time. Okay. Thank you. And the last question for you um, that we have is: uh, What can be done to address the lack of care and maintenance at the Gwinnook Post Office? And the inaccurate mail delivery in the 21207 area. <laughs> well, what, what, it has, what has to be done is uh, people have to take these questions and these concerns to a United States, uh, either the Postal Service or, you, or a Congressperson or United States Senator. We have reached out to the Post Office before uh, trying to get, you know, it took me probably two weeks to get them, maybe more, three weeks to get them to patch a pot up at Randallstown, there's a big pothole, sort of like a sinkhole. It took like three or four weeks for them to patch that. And uh, and we certainly reached out to the United States Postal Service before about the appearance of the uh, Twin Oak Post Office and how it certainly needed a, a makeover. But again, post office had been under fire also. And if you know, to be quite frank, the reason the post office is having uh, such a hard time delivering the mail, they used to be very efficient, and very good. To be quite frank, Donald Trump tried to strip the post office so that they wouldn't be able to deliver mail, so people couldn't mail in ballots against them. And uh, they took up post, they took up mailboxes, uh, they did all sorts of stuff, which is absolutely shameful. They took money out of the system. So that they have to put money into uh, retirements and pensions and and not put you know they they are under different set of rules. So it's been very disheartening to me to see what has happened to the post office in the last couple of years. It is really really shameful because the post office is something that we all need. We rely on it. Many people get medicines from it, and it should never ever ever be caught up into some political fight the way it has. And I'm just hopeful that eventually we can fund the post office properly so that they can deliver the mail. I mean, just the other day, I kid you not, I, I kid you not, I just received post, I mean, mail, I mean, uh, Christmas cards that were not delivered, just got back. I'm not making this up, Christmas cards. Just got back here. Just got back here from Christmas. And from what I understood, is that the plan was to deliver the mail now and then catch up later. So I guess they're in the process of catching up. Yes. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Jones um, about the empty places that are all over around here, especially on Security Boulevard where they have the closed Bennigan's and the closed IHOP. Isn't it something we can do about these empty buildings? Maybe you well, can run those for the um, methadone program. Well, the, the Bennigan's and the AHA, they were uh, closed because we were going to have, they were going to be subway stop on the red line. But the governor killed the red line. So nobody ever went back in there because that was going to be a subway stop. As it relates to the mall, there's multiple owners who can't seem to agree on anything. So that's why not, not much has happened there on the mall. There are people with money who want to go in and buy it all and start all over. So we'll see how that works out. Uh, in terms of other stores, we've been very fortunate in our community, believe it or not. Uh, our community is not, you go to some parts of the county like Essex and some other places where there are places that's been vacant for years. So right now you look at this shop, Sort of the safe, the save a lot supermarket that closed on uh, Security Boulevard and uh, and uh, Woodlawn Drive. 
I, I expect that place will be filled at some point because places around here really don't stay empty too long uh, because the community is vibrant. But you got to understand, many of these things are not issues concerning your government. These are private entities, and we try to encourage growth. We try to help where we can, but uh, you know, and we try to advertise to everybody in the world that hey, come here, here's a supermarket system we can use. Uh, but that's as far as we can go in terms of the government. Our job is roads, schools, police, fire. Okay, so we <clears throat> the last the last question. I guess that's more of a state level question. Um, and then we'll we'll open it up. I know Ms. McCaskill has a has a couple questions, and Mr. Herman Jones. So uh, let's see, uh, Mr. Clark, are you still there? No, he he's not. Okay, so um, Ms. McCaskill, you can go ahead with your questions. Um. Good evening, Julian. It's Alethea McCaskill. Good to see you. Um, I just want to, one, commend the county on the green space, the new open green space um, that was re um, with a news release today. Um, I was excited to hear about that up on Greens Lane. Um, I'm looking forward to that project um, to move forward. I wish it would, would be nice if we can get some movement down here on the lower end of um, Liberty Road, but nonetheless, I am excited about that. The second thing is... Um, well, let me, let me answer that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let me answer that real fast. Uh, that lot on Marston and Sedgwick Ward, right behind the uh, shopping center. Yes. We tried to buy that too. That would have been a pocket parking, but the owners of the property refused to sell it. They felt like we weren't offering them enough money. We told them we were offering them as much as we could. I got involved personally and said, listen, I assure you, don't hold out for more money. This is the best you can get. I've already been involved. We can't give you any more. And they chose not to sell it. So that would have been a pocket park right there. So we are doing our best. Uh, you know, don't ever think that, we, that, we, that we're forgetting below the beltway. We're not. It's part of my district, and I work hard for you guys. So right here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other thing is I had called your office about maybe about two, three months ago in reference. So since COVID has hit, what I've noticed is like I thought I was one of the only people in the neighborhood with a dog. But since COVID hit, we have more neighbors walking, their dogs are out more. And that's really exciting to see the community coming out. The problem is starting to be is um, dog waste. Yeah. And so what I would, what I called your office for, and then I, maybe we can piggyback back and forth for Brian, you all can tell me we can answer this later, but it just would be nice to have something tonight. Um, I called your office in reference to getting some trash receptacles, um, like at Woodmore Elementary School or somewhere in that corridor, because we have a lot of joggers and walking in that area, a lot of dogs, but in, in not even just in people's private yards, although it has happened to me, but in our neighborhoods and on the, you know, it's just a lot of dog waste and people, or for me, for instance, if I'm walking my dog and I do, you know, get it up. I have to carry it around for a mile. <laughs> that stuff get hot in your hand. That stuff get hot in your hand after a while. But I have to carry it around for so long until I get back home. And so your office had told me, and please forgive me for not remembering her name. Um, but anyway, she told me that that has to be taken up with the neighborhood associations to supply receptacles of some kind in that area, um, whether it's at the Liberty Road, Essex Road, Alba Drive, like somewhere in there where most of the foot traffic is. So I just wanted to get some clarification because when I talk to associations, they're like, that's not our responsibility. So where do we go from here with getting some kind of receptacles in the area now that the community is alive and well again? Um, what, what, what should we do? Well, everybody should do what you do. They should take their bag with them. They should clean up their waste. 
They should take their waste to a receptacle if they can find one, or they should take it home and put it in a garbage can. You know, <laughs> this is something that we can certainly try to do, but I guess. Uh-oh. I lost you, Julian. I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. We can try as a government, but the reality is the government can't be the answer for everything. Right. So, you know, we can put up, we can try to get receptacles, we can try to put the, the bags, but generally speaking, these are things that are done by community associations, <laughs> it's done by property managers. That's not something that the county, anywhere in Baltimore County does. Other than, I don't even know if we do it at our parks. Maybe, maybe we do have it at our parks, but we normally don't go into communities putting in these type of uh, items. Now, not to say we can't, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you had the receptacle there, it would be good for you. I mean, will that make other people who are not doing what they're supposed to do now do it? I don't know. Uh, but, you know, people should know to, to clean up behind their pet. And, you know, I don't have an issue looking into putting up the receptacle. I guess no. As I'm sitting here right now, that is not something Baltimore County does, other than in our parks. So before you, because I don't know if you have to leave, and Brian, maybe we can piggyback off of what we can do about it, because we, I, I personally can't rest with no, or we, there's nothing we can do about it. I know there's something we can do, and we have to do something, and so we need to figure out what we can do about it. So my last thing is the homeless camping at the bottom of right there Liberty Road when you're coming off of 695. Have you explored that area yet, Julian? Well, we have been involved in that. That is state highway property. And uh, the state highway has been going through whatever their process it is to uh, try to clean that camp up. They've gone out there several times. Most of the time, I mean, they have a process and how they do and what they do. And they've gone out there a couple of times and they've reported back to us that they didn't find anybody. Uh, and then they hired a company that was going to clean it up. And then and then something happened with that company. And so now they have to go through this process of hiring an additional company to go out and clean it up. So that's where we are with that homeless camp. Uh, but the bottom line is it's a state issue is sitting on state highway property. Okay, so let me just make a suggestion moving forward then. Um, it's still trashed over there just as of tonight. And so maybe since it is in your district, that you have the connection to move that forward faster, not just because it's an eyesore, but also because it starts creating a rodent issue. If there's no one there, we got all kinds of issues that's going to start being created in that area if we don't get it cleaned up. So maybe you can talk to your people to talk to those people to get that done so that we can get that done. You get me? I know you do because you're smiling. So the other thing with that homeless thing is so that we don't keep having you know this um you know this this effect of homeless camps being put everywhere i know we've talked about this before um to some extent in other areas this I, what are we doing to um have we recognized what are we doing to move forward with helping the homeless population in this area? Have we done any studies as to how widespread the homeless population is in this area? Because they seem to be popping up more and more and it's getting closer to home. Well, I can tell you, um, first of all, we, you know, we don't have to, I mean, we can do studies, but we have a big handle on what the homeless population is. Okay. What I've been trying to do, I mean, the county has invested tremendous money and lately dealing with COVID, I mean, we've actually put people in the hotels. Right. So we've been doing an awful lot of things. We have a family homeless shelter on the east side. We have a men's shelter in Catonsville. We have set, we have a, a nine of peace shelter in Windsor Mill and, and Rolling Road. We have uh, Hannah Moore shelter. You know, the issue for me is to do everything I can to stop people from getting or becoming homeless. What a lot right. of people don't realize is uh, 
you know, I've been a champion for affordable housing for quite some time. I uh, was the only one to vote for the source of income legislation back in 2016 and 17. I voted yes, everybody else voted no. I championed that because what I wanted to do was to make it so that all the Section 8 don't end up in two neighborhoods in Baltimore County, Woodlawn, Randallstown, and Essex and Dundalk, which is where they are now, so that people wouldn't discriminate against them so they can move throughout Baltimore County and it wouldn't be a burden on anybody. But what a lot of people don't understand is many people that are out here working are one paycheck away from being homeless, one broken car, one, one, one transmission going up, uh, one engine blowing, and uh, lately, you know, they have to worry about even taking care of the kids. In the past, it was an issue where uh, people, you know, if the kid got sick and you didn't go to work, you didn't get paid. A lot of people are living right here on the edge. So what I've been trying to do since I've been in office is to make sure I'm hitting all the policies to stop people from getting to that point. Because it's very sad when you go to night of feast and I had to step outside because it saddens me to see a family living in a cubicle, a family living in a cubicle. But, you know, these are good people that work hard each and every day, but something happened and they didn't have the resources to fall back on. I'm a member of the Community Assistance Network. I'm a board member and they provide all kinds of assistance. And I've been a board member. They asked me to be a board member because they saw how much I've been helping them and how much I care. So, you know, we do an awful lot and Baltimore County has been doing an awful lot. And it's just a bad part of our society that I wish that someday there would not be any homeless people or we can do a lot better. But unfortunately, you know, like up in Reisterstadt, I actually wanted to get a shuttle bus to drive people to Catonsville and back. Why? Because you have families that are homeless. The mother and the, ch and the daughter or the children can go in Hannah Moore, but the man can't. The, the husband or the, or the man, he has to go to Catonsville. So they are hanging around in Reisterstadt sleeping in doorways. And when the police approach him, they say, hey, I'm waiting on them to get out of the shelter. If you take me down to Catonsville, how do I get back? And the family, we want to be together during the day. So these are some of the issues we have. That's why we built the Family Resource Center on the east side. Because we, and it's like a giant five-story building. It's like, hey, we have to have a place for entire family. So it, it, it's, look, you know, this is an issue all across the country, all around the world, and we're doing our best to handle it. And it's only so much we can do, but we're doing everything we can do. Okay, um, so it's uh, 8.30, we got two last questions. I know uh, Mr. Barnett wanted to ask a question and Mr. Uh, Herman Jones, I don't know, did you ask your question, Mr. Jones? I'm ready. I just have okay. a question on. All right, I'm gonna on be Mr. quick with the answers. Okay, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Jones. I, I wanted to know about this uh, Windsor Mill thing as far as you saying if you're having a problem with getting property uh, paid for. Well, I remember back about five, six years ago, I went up and down Windsor Mill trying to get people to sign this uh, paper to let, it, let their property be taken. But this is where eminent domain come into place, don't they? I mean, you don't, you don't hit these people so many times that they don't want to let go because they don't want to see the traffic come up and down Windsor Mill, not not thinking about how many people done got hit or got killed on the, on uh, Windsor Mill Road. So that's that's one of my questions. Well, and, one of the, I will answer this. We are working on some policies right now. I agree. Uh, you know, we have this issue where you know, we're respectful of people's property but sometimes you have to do what's in the best interest of the community as a whole. We don't like to use the strong arm of the government like eminent domain. We try to work it out as much as we can, but it is a tool that we may have to use more often because I can tell you now, I got communities right now where people are saying, I don't want the sidewalk in front of my house. And a sidewalk is to keep the kids off the street, but the people are saying, this is my property. I don't want a sidewalk. So, you know, what do we do? At some point, we're going to have to get a little tougher and not let, but see, now you're talking about, you know, encroaching on people's property. 
And you know, what do you you know, they don't like it. So go right ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, that, that was my question. The other the other one is 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 it is it right to have a methadone shop in near school? A methadone no. clinic? I, I'm not sure of all the rules there. Like I said earlier today, this is state law and uh I don't like it, but you know, the state has taken a lot of these uh, hours away from us at the local level because they know we will all say no and they have to have them. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. last, last question of the night, um, Mr. Barnett. Uh, but, I, but I will say if, if there's some issues, make the complaints known. If there's issues, uh, if people acting inappropriately, call the police. If uh, if you think your methadone clinic is not doing what they told you to do, call uh, call the state. I forget what it is, uh, what what department. But call them up and and let let them cite it. Okay. All right. Aaron, you had the last question. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, I apologize for being late. I was in a rec council meeting, but um, yeah, uh, councilman, how you doing, um, Julian? My good. my question, my question to you. I've been meeting with uh, my association and Brian as well, uh, Robin Hill, Grindale, uh, Gwen Oak, and uh, we've got a lot of concern <laughs> down on our end, our our end of Liberty Road, and just wondered if you could commit to doing a, uh, possibly doing a walk through the community with us to assess the needs of our community and and, and we can and have your personal input as an intake as to what we need and we can voice, uh, schedule it as to our major concerns because they are voicing their things about a lot of things that are going on in our community. So is it possible that you could do a walk through with us one day and we could schedule it where the president of our associations could meet with you and walk through and show you the needs of our community directly? Sure, that's no problem at all. And you, you will be happy to know that uh, we took care of the, uh, the playground and basketball rims and everything on Winfield, and it's in the budget to take care of everything around there, Powell Hall. So. Well, you oh, you okay, know. Okay. No Say again? I say, you know, Powhatan is definitely a major concern for me, um, but um, I appreciate it. And I guess uh, if you need me to just reach out to your office and uh, yep. schedule it. Uh, is that what you need me for me to do? Yep. Okay. Hey, Aaron, right. it's, it's Alethe. I didn't see you, but I want to make sure I get a, um, a invite to that walkthrough. Yeah. All right. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um. Officer Harris, I just I just want to ask. I just need some information real quick. I know he had the last question, but if you don't mind, go ahead. Um, yes. Um, who, I'm having trouble finding out who to call when commercial um vehicles are parked in residential areas, and I'm not sure who to call. Do you know where I can get that information from? Holy. Uh, one, one. Holy. If a truck is on a private property. Like if they're parked in their driveway, that's a code enforcement issue. If they're on the street, it's the police. And we increase the fines so that, you know, once upon a time, the fines were like 50 bucks. Now they start at 250 and go up to 500 because now we want to make it so that, uh, whereas before they didn't mind getting a ticket, they didn't care. It was much cheaper to get that ticket than do something else with the vehicle. Well, well, I, I understand their concerns, but right now the, the ticket is. 250 and the second offense is $500 all the food. Okay, so suppose your residential street was was also around businesses. Is that for the same like Milford Mill where the old giants used to be? Uh all up and down there and on Church Lane where there are apartment buildings. Is that is that the rules hold for the same? Yes, if it's a if it's a public street. The answer is yes. In okay. Some places, the zoning is different. But the places you're talking about are all uh, regular residential, you know, like, you know, if you go over to like the industrial complex over there, like Whitehead Road, you'll see a bunch of trucks there. But people generally don't complain because, you know, there's nobody living there. Uh, but, you know, where people do live, 
call the police. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. I, I know all, I know all you said, often. I know you said that was the last question, but um Julian, I, I heard something in the rec council meeting tonight and it concerns everyone in our community, and you probably could answer that. Uh, at Gwen Oak Park, they were putting a community garden in uh, uh, Gwen Oak Park, but now they've decided to remove it. Now, uh, going forward, um, if they decide, the county decides to do something like that, can we have a community input meeting to, to let the community at large decide if that's something that we desire or that we want in our, in our, in our park? I saw that the other day and I just thought to myself, what the heck? What in the right, world is right, going right. on there, right? And uh, it got right. to me, it looked like a freaking eyesore in the middle of the park. I mean, you got it this is. beautiful park and, and there's this fence all around. I said, man, what in the world is going on there? So yeah, that that yeah, I, I agree with you. All right, so okay. it's uh, 838 now. So um, thank you, Councilman Jones, for coming out. Um, thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, of course, you guys missed, some of you guys missed uh, Delegate Sheila Bruce. Um, we'll see you at the next one. Now, before you guys go, I know somebody just jumped off already. Um, please visit 4410online.com. There's a chat group in there called uh, Association of Gwen Oak Communities and oh, Gwen Oak. So that is the form. So you guys, if you have questions, put them in there because when we have these guests, we're going to draw those questions from from there, so we can be uh, respectful of their time and also we can filter some of those questions that we can answer before sending it to the um, to our guest speakers. Um, and I, if, whoever, I'm going to put it in there in the chat box. 4410online.com. Just go to the um, chat group. It's right up on the menu. Chat group. Um, talk with Oak, talk uh, Owens and Nails, Caton's, wherever you want to live, wherever you want to jump into, just jump in there. And also um, the Association of Gwinnell Communities, okay? That's the form that we have that I, I, I put that in there for us as a group to throw these questions out there. And um, sometimes we can get answers before we get to a, um, a meeting with guest speakers. So I uh, thank you all for coming. Um, now, see you on the next meeting. I'll post up on the website as well. Thanks, Brian. Good night. Brian. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Officer Glass, I'm still waiting for my.